everybody. We're going to get started now. So glad to see everybody. My name is Karen McCabe, and I'm with the IEEE, where I oversee our collaboration community. And the IEEE is one of the largest professional organizations, and we're dedicated to advancing technology for humanity. We are so delighted and honored to include Dr. Peter Singer as a featured speaker in our Technology for Humanity series. The work he is doing is so critical at this time. The topic of privacy, security, and identity resonates deeply with many of us here. The recent stream of events, including disclosures about NSA surveillance and the widely publicized hacking in stores like Target, have really catapulted forward the high-profile discussion on a very global scale. At the core, our attitudes about privacy, security, and identity form the underpinnings of social trust. Social trust is a critical driver in society and innovation. At IEEE, we believe it's time to rebuild that social trust by working collaboratively to develop the next generation checks, balances, and solutions that will help protect people around the globe. Doing it together takes knowledge and understanding. And this is where Peter's work is so essential, demystifying complex topics and problems to make them easier to understand and solve. Before I bring Peter out, let me tell you a little bit more about him. Peter is a senior fellow and director of the Cent excuse me, Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence at the Brookings Institution. He's a leading expert in cybersecurity and cyber warfare, and his work focuses on changes in global security and technology. He was named by the Smithsonian Institute as one of the leading innovators in the nation, by Defense News as one of the 100 most influential people in defense issues, and by Foreign Policy Magazine in their top 100 global thinkers list. He is a contributing editor to Popular Science Magazine and led the Pentagon's Next Text Project, exploring the implications of game-changing technologies. He's also founder of a technology and entertainment consulting firm that has provided award-winning counsel to entertainment companies like Warner Brothers, DreamWorks, Universal, and HBO, and for the video game Call of Duty, the best-selling entertainment project in history. He's also a producer of Unmanned, an independent film project following a young drone pilot at War and Home. Peter is author of Corporate Warriors, which pioneered the study of new industry of private companies providing military service for hire. His next book, Children at War, was the first book to explore the tragic rise of child soldier groups and help change UN peacemaking training. His third book, Wired for War, The Robotics Revolution and Conflict in the 21st Century, looked at the implications of robotics for war, politics, ethics, and law. And his newest book, Cybersecurity and Cyber War, What Everyone Should Know, has been recommended by sources as diverse as the chairman of Google, the United States Army and Navy, the Washington Post, Al Jazeera, and more. You can learn more about this book at cybersecurity.com. So I leave you in very good hands as you prepare yourself to face the challenges of this new, this new big data era. We believe you'll find Peter's perspective well-informed and insightful. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Austin welcome for Dr. P.W. Singer. So, hi, I wanted to first start off by thanking South by Southwest and IEEE. This is part of their Technology for Humanity series. I urge you to check out online all the different events they have here at South by Southwest. There's 17 in total, including a party that you're all invited to on Sunday night. Uh, so, what's my story on this? Uh, why am I talking about computers and cyber war? I'm old enough to remember the very first computer that I ever saw. It was a Commodore, if you can remember those. And my father took me to a science center in North Carolina to learn how to program this incredible device to do something very special. We designed a smiley face out of a series of letter M's which then printed out on one of those old spool printers. You remember those that you tear the perforated paper off the side? Now, three decades later, the centrality of computers to my life, all our lives, it's almost impossible to comprehend. We now live in a world where almost 40 trillion emails are sent a year. The first website was created in 1991. Today, there's over 30 trillion websites out there. 
Moreover, the internet is no longer just about compiling or sending information online. It's starting to ripple out to affect the real world through the emerging Internet of Things. Indeed, Cisco estimates that over the next five years, the number of Internet-enabled devices will rise to over 40 billion, as everything from cars to refrigerators to thermostats to gadgets literally not yet conceived all link into this globalized network of networks. And so in short, in domains that range from communication to commerce to infrastructure to, yes, conflict, 98% of U.S. military communications go over the civilian-owned and operated Internet. All of these depend on this world. We truly are, as um, Eric Schmidt said on this stage yesterday, living in a new digital age. But in this very short history of computers that's played out in our lives, I would argue that it's also reached a defining point. Just as the upside of the cyber domain is rippling out there, with all the exciting stuff we're seeing here at South by Southwest, with rapid and unexpected consequences, so too is the risk side. Now, there's a number of ways you can look at this. You can certainly see it in a variety of astounding numbers. For example, every single second, nine new pieces of malware software designed to cause computer harm. Every single second, nine new pieces are discovered. Or another number, 97% of Fortune 500 companies have admitted that they've been hacked. The other 3% have been too, they just aren't willing to do so yet. More than 100 different nations have created some kind of cyber military command, some kind of military unit designed to fight and win wars in this space. Indeed, the very first poll that Pew did to kick off 2014, found that Americans are more afraid of a cyber attack than they are of Iranian nuclear weapons, North Korean nuclear weapons, climate change, the rise of China, or an authoritarian Russia. They fear cyber attacks more. Now, this has led to a massive industry, arguably one of the fastest growing industries out there in the world, that's on pace to double over the next three years to $120 billion worth of revenue out there. And don't just think about this as private business. We're seeing this growth, this cybersecurity business growing on the public sector side as we create bureaucracies at the national, state, and even local level. Just to give you an example of the, the fears that may be coalescing around a so-called uh, cyber industrial complex, if you look at the Pentagon's budget statement, two years ago it used the word cyber 12 times. This year it used the word cyber 147 times. Or just this week, the Pentagon strategy paper, the QDR, the Quadrennial Defense Review, came out. It used the word cyber 46 times, once every other page. It used the word Russia once. And we're seeing this play out, of course, back onto the business side. In 2001, there were four companies that were lobbying Congress on cybersecurity issues. Last year, over 1,500. So the bottom line is that for all the hope and promise of the digital age, we also need to admit to ourselves that we are living in an era of cyber insecurity. Now, before I go much further, it's at this point that I'd like to try and do something uh, a little bit counterintuitive, but maybe it might help make that point. A lot like the challenge of how do you write a book about a world of zeros and ones, a cyber world, and make it interesting is how do you do that for a speech? What kind of visuals do you have, particularly when you're at South by Southwest? So what I'm going to do is um, play before you a collection of what I consider some of the best and worst examples of cyber war art that's out there. And you'll have to, you know, we're all art critics here, so you'll have to decide for yourself which is which. And the point, I'm not going to speak to it, I'm not going to click through, they're just going to play behind me. It's first to give you something else to look at when you get tired of looking at me. Second, studies have shown that you're about double the times more likely to remember what I'm saying if you're looking at something at the same time even if it's not related to what I'm talking about. It's just the weird way that our human brains work. And that's an important point when I'll get back to the centrality of figuring in how humans work rather than just the technology. And finally, I think the visualizations show us this world of cyber insecurity that we live in. So the technology's working, there we go. So let's pull back on all of this. Why a book about cybersecurity and cyber war 
And why now? Well, what motivated me was perhaps best encapsulated by two quotes. The first was from President Obama, who declared that cybersecurity risks pose, quote, the most serious economic and national security challenges of the 21st century. The second quote is from the former director of the CIA, who said, quote, rarely has something been so important and so talked about with less and less clarity and less apparent understanding, and as well with cats. So you can see this gap between importance and understanding in all sorts of different fields and ways. Again, go to the numbers. 70% of business executives, not 70% of CTOs or CIOs, but 70% of execs have made some kind of cybersecurity decision for their company, despite the fact that no major MBA program teaches it as part of your normal management responsibility. It's the same thing in the schools that we teach our journalists, our diplomats, our lawyers, you name it. Or you can come at it from not the numbers, but the anecdotes that fill the book that we did that are both funny, but frankly, a little bit sad. For example, the former Secretary of Homeland Security, the agency ostensibly in charge of civilian cybersecurity in the United States, told us how, quote, don't laugh, but I just don't use email at all. It wasn't a fear of privacy or security. It's because she just didn't think it was useful. She went on to say that she hadn't been on social media for over a decade, which, if you know your history, is a lot like saying you've really never been on it. Go to the judicial branch. A Supreme Court justice told how, quote, they hadn't yet gotten around to email. Eventually, they'll get around to it, but not just yet. This is someone who, in the upcoming year, is going to vote on everything from net neutrality to the constitutionality of some of the NSA operations. Go to the diplomatic side. We were actually asked by a U.S. official about to go off and negotiate with the Chinese on cybersecurity questions what an ISP was. That's a lot like going off to negotiate with the Soviets and asking what an ICBM is. This is not just an American phenomena, though. We were told the same by officials in places that range from China to Great Britain to France to Abu Dhabi. For example, the cybersecurity czar in Australia didn't know what Tor was, which is obviously a critical technology in this space. And if you don't know, you know, you can buy the book. But the point that I'm getting at here is that cybersecurity is as crucial to areas as intimate as your privacy, as important to you personally as the security of your bank account, to it's affecting the future of world politics. And then they connect back, because as illustrated in the Snowden affair, questions about privacy are playing out in geopolitics, but also come back to your personal level but it's been treated as largely an area only for the it crowd, for the IT folks. In turn, the technical community that understands the workings of the hardware and the software doesn't deal well with the wetware, the human side of this. They often look at things through a very specific lens and fail to appreciate the broader picture or make connections across different fields. And so the danger of this stovepiping, it, it's diverse. Each of us, in whatever roles we play in life, make decisions about cybersecurity that then affect the real world beyond computers. But we often do so without proper tools, basic terms and essential concepts that define both what's possible, but also what's proper, what's right and wrong. They're being missed, or even worse, abused and distorted. Past myth and future hype weave together, obscuring actually what happened with where we are really, where we are right now, with where we'll be in the future. So the end result is that some threats are overblown and overreacted to, and other real threats are ignored. So for example, I'm someone who loves history, and it absolutely pains me when I hear, and I've heard this done by everything from White House officials to senators, to four-star generals, to newspaper columnists, say things like, cyber weapons are, quote, just like a WMD, and therefore we need to act like this is, quote, just like a new Cold War. If you know both your history and your technology side, you quickly realize the comparison is not the ones that they think they're making. If there's a historic comparison to the Cold War, it's to that early period when we didn't understand both the workings of the technology, but even more so the political dynamics that they were driving, 
such that we took the real world versions of Dr. Strangelove seriously. For example, in the book, there's the um, story of the Air Force's real plan that they explored to nuke the moon, to prove to the Soviets that we could do interesting stuff in space too. We have a lot of that same kind of thinking going on right now in cyber. So let me go into some of the more uh, direct manifestations of this problem. One is that we too often lump things together simply because they involve zeros and ones of software. Take the idea of cyber attacks. The lead US general for the military cyber command and director of the NSA, which if you pull back and think about it, that double hatting is a rather odd situation that we wouldn't allow happen in other domains, but we allow it here. But let's set that aside. He testified to Congress, quote, every day America's armed forces face millions of cyber attacks. But to get those millions, he was combining everything from probes and address scans that never entered our networks to attempts to carry out pranks, to attempts to carry out political protests, to attempts to steal, to attempts to carry out stealing of an espionage nature, diplomatic espionage, economic espionage, traditional national security espionage. But none of those millions of attacks that he was testifying to Congress were what the people in the room thought he was talking about, which was the cyber Pearl Harbor, a term that's been used both by government officials and repeated in the media over a half million times. Essentially what people are doing when they're discussing cyber attack is they're lumping together all of these different like and unlike activities simply because they involve the same technology. The parallel would be a lot like saying a group of teenagers with firecrackers, a group of political protesters in the street with a smoke bomb, a bank robber with a shotgun, James Bond with his Walter PPK pistol, a terrorist with a roadside bomb, and a Russian cruise missile. Those are all the same, right? Because they use the technology of gunpowder. Of course not. We would never do that but somehow it's okay to discuss it that way in this space. Or take the organizations in it. I had a senior US government, actually a senior US military official, argue with me that Anonymous and Al-Qaeda were the same thing. Now, I don't care where you stand on Anonymous, and I've, for example, uh, discovered that I'm probably one of the most empathetic people in the DC security establishment towards them, both because of uh, what they've done for internet freedom and maybe I'm just scared of them. But the bottom line is, I don't care where you stand on it. It's very clear that they share nothing with Al-Qaeda and everything from their organizational structure their personnel and individuals and typical personnel profile, their means, and their ends, their goal. The only thing the two organizations share is they're both non-state actors that begin with the letter A. So you're not going to be effective in, in this if you treat it that way. So these gaps in understanding, these disconnects of policy and reality, it means that we're often um, seeing not only growing tension in this space, but we're repeatedly taken advantage of. We're taken advantage of at the individual level. When you get that email from your mom saying, gosh, I'm stuck in Thailand. Can you please send your bank account information? And you go, ah, I didn't realize mom was in Thailand, but I really do need to help her. We laugh about that, but at the G20 conference, the most important international conference of the year, diplomats were spearfished. They received an email with an exciting offer. If they would just click this link, they would be able to see nude photos of the former French First Lady, the one that used to be the model and rock star. Many of them could not resist this wonderful offer, clicked the link, and of course, downloaded spyware under their computers instead. Or were taken advantage of at the organizational level, the business level, the agency level, alternatively not doing enough to protect ourselves, or hiring hucksters that offered to solve all our cybersecurity problems with some kind of silver bullet widget. Or frankly, we're taken advantage of at the national political level, which is, I believe, behind a number of the issues that are playing out with the NSA. This can even happen with a president. Reportedly, Obama expressed his, quote, frustration that the complexity of the technology was overwhelming policymakers. Now, our inability to have a proper discussion about this it also creates not just a distortion of threats, but a misapplication of resources. Perhaps the best illustration is another number, 31,300. 
That's the number of academic journal and major media articles that have been written on the phenomena of cyber terrorism. Zero. That's the number of people that have actually been hurt or killed by a real incident of cyber terrorism. In many ways, cyber terrorism is a lot like Discovery Channel Shark Week, where we obsess about the danger from sharks, even though you're 15,000 times more likely to be hurt on your toilet. But the difference is that JAWS, there's a real world version of it that has happened and happens on a regular basis. Now, let me be 100% clear here. I am not saying that terrorists don't use the internet. In fact, they use the internet mostly like the rest of us do. And there's a series of chapters in the book about it. Nor am I saying that there aren't real dangers here. For example, the exam uh, Stuxnet, the digital weapon that we created to sabotage Iranian nuclear research, shows that cyber attacks are both real and can have real physical consequences. But what I'm getting at is the way it's portrayed is too often put as if it's quite easy. For example, a um, senior uh, US government official talked about, and this was roughly his quote, that a couple of teenage hackers sipping Red Bull in their parents' basement could carry out a WMD-style attack. I hate to tell you, Red Bull gives you wings. It doesn't give you that capability. Stuxnet was something that was both caused physical change, but it also required a massive amount of resources and expertise to build it that teenagers don't have, everything from top technical skill set in hacking, but also intelligence an analysis and collection, expertise in fields that range from engineering to nuclear physics to the ability to physically deploy it. This was not just in their skill set. So to put it another way, Al-Qaeda would like to, but it can't. China could, but doesn't want to, for both of them yet. My point, though, is that strategy whether it's at the national political level, at your business level, at your individual level. It's always about choices. It's always about priorities. So we need to weigh the centrality of what we talk about in our discussions and what we obsess about versus the very real and arguably greater threats that are out there. So for example, if we're looking at economic security consequences, I would look at the massive campaign of intellectual property theft that's happening right now, much of it back to China, that is essentially the largest theft in all of human history that's playing out right now. Or if you care more about national security consequences, don't just focus on things that sound sexy, like a cyber Pearl Harbor, but instead look at what cyber war really is and look at how the military really does carry out computer network operations. Or look back to that economic security question and weigh what happens as all that intellectual property is lost. Or maybe one of the things we've learned from 9-11 is it's not just the direct action that matters, but it's all the ripple effects, all the ways we react to it. So I'm, for example, deeply worried about what the combination of a massive wave of cyber crime our own government's efforts to stop traditional forms of terrorism and attempts by mostly authoritarian state governments to change the underlying governance model of the internet, to block the flow of information, the Chinese great internet firewall, the 82,000 Russian blacklisted websites. I'm worried about what the combination of these three things together is doing to that core value, trust, that made the internet the most powerful tool for political, economic, and social progress, not just in my lifetime, but maybe even all of history. If we don't watch out, the internet that we've known and enjoyed will not be the ones that our kids inherit, all because of that lost trust. This gap in the field also means that we too often act on bad assumptions or don't make connections across domains in ways that truly matter. So take the notion of offense versus defense. There's this idea that cyber offense is inherently dominant against cyber defense. And in fact, as one US military report put it, it will be this way, quote, for the foreseeable future. This in turn has driven the military to focus much of its research and development efforts on cyber offense. If you run the numbers, it's roughly about two and a half to four times as much spending on cyber offense research and development, looking for that breakthrough on the offense side versus looking for breakthroughs on the defense side. 
there's a threefold problem with this. The first is cyber offense is not as easy as it's too often portrayed. That's that example of Stuxnet. It's tough to pull these things off, to do them well, and not just a single attack, but an overall campaign. And second, cyber defense isn't like some turtle lying on its back, helpless. There's things that you can do, and things we can do better. The second is history is replete with examples that pretty much every time militaries faced a period of technologic disruption, they would choose the offensive doctrine, believing that it would, it would be dominant forever, and then they'd get a wake-up call. We are on the 100-year anniversary of one of the most important illustrations of this. If you, back in 1914, pretty much every military in Europe looked around and said, because of these new technologies, the offense is going to be dominant, and we can't be stuck on the defense. And so at the first point of crisis, we've got to go. That turned out to be a mistake. To be on the defense in World War I was actually pretty good. The third, though, is even if all this is true, we're not in the Cold War anymore. And a lot of the lessons from a binary system and deterrence don't hold here. So if you are worried about everything from states to terrorists to criminal groups to gangs of roving teenagers, and you're sitting in a glass house, your best reaction is not to say to yourself, you know what I really need? A stone sharpening kit. That's not good strategic thinking, but that's where we're at. So what can we do in all of this? The, the last third of the book is all of these what can we do kind of questions from the global level to the business level down to the personal level. So I'm not going to try and sum them up in my remaining time, but essentially focus on five key themes that I think cut across all of this. The first theme is knowledge matters. It is absolutely vital that we demystify this realm if we're ever going to get anything effective done in securing it. We have to move past the point where, as a White House official put it to me, cyber is, quote, the domain for the nerds. Or where the president reportedly received a briefing on cyber issues and then asked for it repeated back, quote, this time in English. That's not to knock President Obama. That would happen at pretty much every major corporation, university, human rights group, you name it. Second, people matter. Cybersecurity is one of those wicked problem areas, but it's wicked because of all the trade-offs and complexities. Not the technical side, but the people part. Now, this makes it really useful from a writer's perspective because you get you know, fun, spicy stories like the role of pornography in cybersecurity to that episode where Pakistan accidentally kidnapped all the world's cute cat videos for a day. But it also means that if you want to set up your responses at the global level all the way down to your um, business level, you need to recognize that the people behind the machines are inherently inside both every problem and every solution. That leads to the third point. Incentives matter. If you want to understand why something is or isn't happening in cybersecurity, look to the motivations. Look to the relative costs. Look to the organizations and bureaucracies and values that people hold. There is a reason why finance companies are better than power grid companies, not just at their own cybersecurity, but at sharing between them, because the incentives align really well. But again, don't just focus on those scenarios that we keep being fed. The power grid might go down. Well, in reality, squirrels have taken down the power grid more times than the zero times that hackers have. So we need to not just focus on those. Uh, for example, healthcare both has the largest number of reported intrusions, and as one industry expert put it well, quote, if our financial industry regarded security the way the healthcare sector does, I would stuff my cash in a mattress. This point about incentives also leads to the government role, what it can and should play. In some situations, it needs to be a trusted information provider. In other situations, carrying out research that the market isn't incentivized to do. In other situations, it's got to change the market incentives through things like standards and maybe even regulation. We need it to act in the same way that it has in everything from uh, your butcher and bakery to nuclear power plants. Fourth, history matters. 
there's a history to how we got here with the internet and we need to recognize it. And that will allow us to respond better when people say silly things, which this has been said in, in DC a number of times. Let's just build a more secure new internet. It's not happening. So why even talk about it? I joke that um, the idea of rebooting the internet makes as much sense as um, rebooting Beverly Hills 90210. It just, it never happened. Um, but it also means that there are a wealth of lessons to learn from history outside the internet domain. So if you're worried about the threat of both private criminal and quasi-state linked actors in a realm of commerce and communication, then look at how they dealt in the age of sale with their pirates and privateers. There's a lot of parallels between privateers and these cyber militias and patriotic hacker communities that are out there. Or if you want to look towards how should the government act, then learn the lesson from the most effective government agencies in history. For example, the role of the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, which started with a group of scientists taking a $10 collection. And that agency went on to do everything from eradicate malaria inside the United States, smallpox on a global level. It served as a crucial back channel to the Soviets during the Cold War. This leads to the fifth and final point. Ben Franklin had the famous saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The CDC did studies and found that that was true in public health. It's also true in cybersecurity. While we want to complexify this, while we want to think that spending will lead us to the land of safety, or that we need some kind of man on cyber horseback to come save us, the reality is that ba very basic steps of cyber hygiene would go an incredibly long way. In fact, one study found that the top um, control measures, very simple measures, would stop 94% of all cyber attacks. Heck, the most important penetration of secure US military networks by an outside spy agency happened when they did a candy drop. That spy agency left a shiny memory stick in the dirt of a parking lot outside a US base. A soldier saw that shiny thing, picked it up, took it inside the base, and plugged the memory stick into his computer linked to a classified network. That's not just cyber hygiene. That's basic hygiene. That's the five second rule. <laughs> this idea of hygiene, though, is not just about the preventive measures. It's also about the mentality shift that we need. There is an ethic of collective responsibility that we need, again, on the global level, the business level, all the way down to the individual level. We teach our kids hygiene, things like cover your mouth when you cough, not just to protect themselves, but to give them the sense of responsibility for protecting everyone else that they connect with in their real world life. We need that same ethic in our online life, our responsibility at the collective level. So to bring this story uh, full circle, at the beginning of the talk, I explained how you know, I first saw a computer when I was a young kid. The idea that this machine would one day do everything from steal people's money, steal people's identity, be a weapon of mass disruption, it would have scared my seven-year-old little self. I would have begged my dad, don't press the power button. Today we wouldn't have it any other way. And the reason is because these machines and the network that they're linked into have given us what we would have regarded back then as superpowers. The idea that you could instantly find the answer to almost any question that you have, that was a superpower back then to the various gadgets that we're seeing on display here. They're literally something from the movies of superpowers of heroes and superheroes. And we accept them as just normal. So my point is this, the same as it was back then is how it should be today in the future. We have to accept and manage the risks of the world, whether it's the online world or the real world, because of all that we can achieve in it. And in the end, to steal a line from the book, that's what everyone needs to know. Thank you. So now we're going to open up uh, to our question period uh, via Twitter, PW Singer is our hashtag. 
So here's our, our first question. What are the emerging and future technologies that we'll have, we will have to worry uh, about for the most, excuse me, what are the emerging and future technologies that we will have to worry the most about from a security perspective? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> well, first, let's be clear. Every single new technologic advance has had some kind of security risk that came out of it. And that goes back to literally the first time that Og picked up a stone. He either used it to build something or to bash someone in the head. And that's the same thing that plays out today with drones. At the end of the day, technology is a tool. It's a tool that you apply to a task. And then people decide whether that task is going to be for good or evil on the battlefield or not. Um, when we're looking today, in, um, I see a series of game-changing technologies that are out there, disruptive technologies, killer apps, whatever you want to call them, technologies that give us uh, both capabilities but questions that we didn't imagine we'd have a generation ago. So it's, you know, I've written, a, my last book was on robotics. That will continue today as they become more autonomous to, in, uh, to 3D printing. Again, there's positive and negative manifestations of that. Human performance modifications, biotech. Uh, and then in this space, I see the cross between cyber weaponry and the Internet of Things as being a particular game change, where we've seen cyber weapons, Stuxnet, what, what made it a weapon, the first true cyber weapon, is that it caused physical change in the world. That's what weapons have always done. They've not been about stealing information or blocking, it's about causing physical change. Stuxnet um, sabotaged those Iranian nuclear, nuclear research facilities. But it was also different and that it was the first weapon that wasn't a thing. It was zeros and ones. And that meant it was a weapon that could be here, there, and everywhere. It was in 25,000 different computers at the same time. It also opens up a new kind of riddle from a um, legal ethical standpoint, and that you could argue Stuxnet may have been the first ethical weapon. It's the first weapon in all of human history that could only cause damage to the one target in the world that it was designed to. Even if you had a series of nuclear centrifuges in your basement, Stuxnet wouldn't have, wouldn't have hardened them. But the flip side of that is the ease of use maybe creates a, a slippery slope where we'll see this more and more. So cyber weaponry is growing. And then with the Internet of Things, we're seeing more devices linked in where causing change to them will cause physical damage in a way that matters. So, you know, there's a session here on um, cars and being linked into the Internet of Things. And you, you've probably seen that commercial where, uh, you know, the, the guy's coming back from some tropical vacation and he remotely turns on his car and all those sorts of things. That's great. That's fantastic. But we've already seen car hacking. People remotely taking over certain controls of the car contrary to what the owner wants. In some situations, they're doing it to gain information. A uh, foreign uh, agency um, uh, allegedly got into the, um, the equivalent Bluetooth systems of a, of a, of a device. Um, to others, it will be to take physical control. And that loops you back to one of the other game-changing technologies, which is robotics, because what that offers the possibility when you don't have the human inside in, in physical control is what I call battles of persuasion, where you're not seeking to destroy the target but you're seeking to persuade it to do what you want. So rather than shooting a missile at a, a jet fighter, you're cyber attacking it to gain access of the drone and then causing it to do something contrary to what the owner wants. And we've already seen um, illustrations of that. A, a team in Texas uh, hacked the GPS of a drone to trick it into thinking it was somewhere else other than where it was. So this is the future of war, is the synergy of these game-changing technologies and new doctrines um, all coming together. Great, thank you. Our next question, do you think that Al-Qaeda and the extremist groups are successful with their social media strategies and with their cyber attacks? So let, let's distinguish between social media strategy and cyber attack. So I think they've been relatively effective in terms of if you're looking for a, you know investment versus payoff, a bang for buck, um, they've got incredibly limited resources and through this technology they've been able to hit a wider audience. I mean, go look at the history, the name Al-Qaeda itself, um, the base, it refers to in pre-internet days, they all, Al-Qaeda was, came from the idea of people going through the same training camps in Afghanistan. 
And if you went through, which were called the base, and if you went through them, you were known, trusted. It wasn't just you had the skill set. It was you were someone who was within the fold. And the original propaganda was distributed first through audio cassette tapes and then through videotapes. Now, you know, we've had terrorists live tweeting their attacks. And that gives them an, a, a, an, a, an ability to carry out propaganda, information warfare, however you want to describe it, in a much more effective manner. But we also need to be very careful here. There's a, um, a chapter in the book on this. There's a, sometimes this mentality of, you know, we'll take them offline, knock them offline. But there's also value in counterterrorism to the fact that they are online because it gives you the ability to collect information about them, not just the individuals, but things like what are their tools, techniques, and procedures that they're sharing with each other. It's a way of learning about the enemy. Um, and so there's a back and forth in it. That's different than the, the second part of the question was, how, are, how is Al-Qaeda at its cyber attacks? Um, pretty sucky because they've not done any one cyber attack uh, effective. And in the interviews that at least have gone public of people at um, Guantanamo, they very rarely uh, tried it. And when they did, it was things like trying to deface the website of the Israeli prime minister, kind of annoying things, but not physically consequential in terms of compared to their other activities out there. Now, let me be 100% clear. I'm not saying they won't try this in the future, but so far they've not been very good at it. Thank you. Next up, in cyber warfare, how is the civilian soldier binary eroded or redefined? Oh, goodness. Um, so first, the term cyber war itself, uh, it's as abused as the word war is. You know, how we describe war for everything from the war on drugs, the war on poverty, uh, the war on sugar that's playing out in New York, or the war on Christmas that's playing out in the minds of Fox News anchors. Um, <laughs> To in turn, there's things that are actual wars by the traditional meaning of the term, political violence, that we don't call that. So, you know, remember Korea? That was a police action at the time. To today, uh, we've carried out more than 400 drone strikes into Pakistan. No one calls that a war, even though if you had said 20 years ago, 400 airstrikes in another country, you must be at war. So the term war is abused, cyber war is even worse. Um, so that leads to often we mush together things that we call cyber war that are not, and that further leads to that blurring of the lines between civilian and military. So as an illustration of the two sides of this problem, uh, a major news magazine, actually I believe the picture flashed in front of you, had an article, on a cover article, cyber war, and it had a city blowing up under a digitized mushroom cloud. But if you read the article, you know, it's things like credit card fraud and denial of service attacks. It's not what we would think about as war. We see that actually playing out today. There's been a lot of um, use of the word cyber war to describe uh, what's playing out between Russia and Ukraine. Um, it hasn't been in that space. Actually, much of the problem has been on the cyber side. Uh, Russia, someone, I, I saw this news report that said they carried out a denial of service. Well, what they did is they seized the telephone stations and cut the line physically. So it's a denial of service, but not in the way you know, we think of it in cyber terms. But what I'm getting at is this, this blurring also hits the notion, I worry more about this than the media side, than in, in the terms of responsibilities. So for example, um, when Cyber Command on the US was arguing for an increase in its budget, it's effectively doubled, it justified it um, in one testimony by saying it was needed to help protect American power companies. That's the responsibility of American power companies. And when they think that, no, the man on cyber horseback is going to come save me, they don't make the kind of investments that they should be doing in their own security practices. The way, for example, we've seen this um, in other sectors. Or you see a framing, um, similarly, uh, you know, oh, we, we, we will see senior officials say things like, uh, you know, there was this attack on a, on a um, bank, and that's a reason for this. You know, go, again, go to the metaphor. If you had a bank moving cash in an armored van 
from one bank to another. And a group of protesters in the street wearing these funny masks stood in the street for a couple of hours, blocked the movement of that truck, and they stood in the lobby. And then after a couple hours, they dissipated. No one would say, gosh darn it, where was the U.S. military? We've done that in this space. So it's not the blur, what I worry about in the blurring of lines is more importantly the blurring of responsibilities and the other parts of government and the public sector, the pu public and private sector partnerships that need to be happening that aren't right now. Um, another data point to throw at you, we're spending about 12 times as much um, cyber dollars in the Pentagon than we are all the other U.S. government agencies. Now, I very much think we do need to be spending in the cyber military side, but the fact that we're not doing it in these other agencies, this imbalance deeply worries me. Great. A little historical reference here. Eisenhower warned about the military-industrial complex. Is it wise that we now seem to embrace it as the only viable solution? Um, so the, the military-industrial complex, you know, I made a, a reference to, you could see potential of the, the brewing side of this uh, with the combination of lots of business, um, and it's a very active sector. 15% uh, of all mergers and acquisitions in the defense world have been of cyber companies. Um, so lots of stuff going on there, and the budget side, and the, the framing of it. Uh, so you can see this coming together, but there's two things that are interesting to me. One, it's to corporatize it is a very classical American response. We see similar levels of activity in other nations. If you look at the raw numbers of people, they're just not in businesses. They're in things like cyber militias. You know, so you have several hundred thousand people doing this in China. They're just not organized into businesses trying to make money off it. Um, more importantly is you know, Eisenhower originally referred to the other core part of the military industrial complex, which was Congress. And they've, uh, like so many other issues, um, they've been so incredibly effective in this space. Uh, Congress hasn't passed major cybersecurity um, legislation since 2002. That's five years before the iPhone, let alone today's issues of metadata and Google Glass. And so that's creating, I think, some of these. It's often the problem here is not policy. It's the absence of policy or incredibly old policies that need to be updated. And again, you can see that in everything from civilian cybersecurity protection to the issues playing out with the NSA. So a little, a little history to now some future. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the deep web and cyber currencies such as Bitcoin? Um, two, two things on, on these, these issues. The first is they point to the challenge, and, and it's apt to this series that IEEE is, is hosting for us, of the balance between privacy and security. We want to act like it's something new, and yet, you know, go back to the writings of the Founding Fathers. They were equally troubled about these trade-offs, and, and one of the things that particularly you know, perturbed them about the British was um, searching houses without a warrant and the like. So these are not new issues. They're just manifesting themselves in new and different ways. Um, one of the problems on the public sector side uh, is that often uh, our different parts of our government are operating in contradiction of each other. So that's a good sign that you don't have a good strategy when, uh, for example, Tor, originally paid for by Pentagon money, Department of Navy, pushed by folks in agencies like the State Department as a great way for political activists and dissidents in authoritarian states to protect themselves. Simultaneously, if you use it, one of the, um, one of the ways that you get in the NSA sweep so you have a technology that the U.S. government paid for, and at the same time, it's saying if you use it, well, you must be up to no good. That's a similar, um, you know, so we're going to have to figure out these balances. The Bitcoin um, aspect, uh, I'll just say, you know, where on that, 
I grew worried about Bitcoin not on the security question, but when um, someone, when an elderly woman asked me, should she have it part of her retirement portfolio? And when it's got that kind of hype factor around it, uh, it you know looked like okay, this is going to be an you know an unstable market, and I think we've kind of seen it play out there. But that's different than a security question. Ah, interesting question. <laughs> As we get more into a, a personal privacy uh, question here, can you truly be anonymous online? Short answer, no. <laughs> um, because at some point you will, you are using, when you are online, you are leaving traces of your actions and then there is still a physical, you are physically and the hardware that you depend on located inside someone's territory. That's, you know, there was an interesting back and forth in the, in the prior session here. There's this belief that the internet has changed everything and um, the power of the state has been limited and you'll, you'll see, you know, manifestos saying, you know, you, you old, um, I, I believe uh, Assange, you know, talked about it as elderly and the like. The internet has challenged state power and has empowered groups and individuals in new ways, but the big dogs still bark and bite. They haven't gone away. And the very fact that he was speaking from inside an embassy is a good illustration of that. And so it's about finding that, it, it, it's too often um, uh, these absolutes, it's absolute state government overreach, or it's absolute freedom in the online world. And look, that doesn't happen in the real world, so why should we think this is going to be so fundamentally different? And that, it's often, that's my frustration with the discourse in this space, again, is that it often feels, whether you're talking about cyber threats or the internet freedom debate, I feel like I'm watching Spinal Tap, you know, turn the volume up to 11, and that's not the most effective way to, to, to really solve our problem sets here. So how can companies be encouraged to be proactive about security rather than reactionary? So for companies, I think uh, there's a series of things that, that ought to be undertaken, but really it's about a, a mentality shift. Um, it's about understanding that there are real threats, but also they have responsibilities to it. And at the end of the day, their incentives are going to have to align better for it. Um, what's fascinating, I'm seeing more companies react to the target breach than the Snowden affair because it's um, a series of companies that didn't think they had to care about this in the same way. And then more important than what happened to them is they saw us, they saw their consumers and clients change their actions. They, it, it, you know, how we react incentivizes the firms that service us. And one of the things that I hope they do is not be taken in by, you know, again, hucksters, um, companies that promise to solve all their problems if they just spend a little. Uh, instead, we have to start thinking about this as resilience. And you can think about resilience in a physical way or a psychological way. You know, so instead of just buying a fi building a higher wall, you know, my body has a great exterior layer of defense, my skin. But it expects that that's not the only thing that's going to work. It expects that it fails. In fact, there are 10 times as many foreign cells in my body right now as there are human cells. My body has all sorts of different ways of dealing with them, everything from you know, internal monitoring systems to figure out when there's an anomaly to triaging, um, all sorts of different reactions. And we need to be similarly thinking about our, our technology and our defenses in that way rather than just, oh, I need to buy, you know, kind of an exterior layer of defense. The psychology side, though, again, goes back to how we talk about it in the media and the like. There's far more money to be made in saying, get scared, and that's whether it's the hucksters or the media, than saying, keep calm and carry on. Cyber resilience is about the fact that, yes, bad things will happen. As long as you are online, there will be cyber threats out there. What matters is how do you power through them? How do you prepare for them? How do you get back up quickly when you're knocked down? 
That's the way we ought to be operating in this space. Great. Does the NSA surveillance network undermine online security against other less friendly infiltration or attacks? The challenge of the Snowden affair, um, and it's fun to see you know, what he'll have to say in a couple of days. The challenge is he took so much that essentially there's three different buckets. So when we say NSA surveillance network, there's three different kinds of activities that have been disclosed. And too often in the discourse, we focus on one or the other. So the first bucket of activities is, guess what? The NSA carries out espionage against America's enemies. Smart strategic espionage. The second category is what you could call questionable. Legally questionable, politically questionable, basically related to some kind of collection on, of, uh, on a mass scale of American citizens' information, either directly by the agency or indirectly, including by allied foreign intelligence services, but basically in the questionable category. Category three that was revealed is um, what you could uh, kindly call unstrategic and more accurately call stupid. Um, and that is directly targeting close American allied political leaders and the security of American technology companies. The problem, though, is when we want to either attack or defend in this affair, want to say whether he's a traitor or he's a whistleblower or NSA was right or wrong, we pull from one of the buckets. We pull from the bucket that we care the most about. And, and that's, a, that's a very simplistic bumper sticker way of talking about it. And that's my uh, personal frustration with how it plays out. And in fact, it, you, know, you can simultaneously have both good and bad actions. And someone simultaneously can do something that is both traitorous and a whistleblower. That's the, the, the problem is we want to have it in one distinct manner again despite the fact that the real world doesn't work that way. Interesting question coming up here. Which state or non-state actors are best at, one, cyber offense, and two, cyber defense? So cyber offense versus cyber defense, and uh, which state actors are best and why? So uh, cyber offense, one of the things that uh, the Snowden Affair revealed, so is it a good or a bad thing from a research standpoint, is just how good the US is at cyber offense. Um, and often in these, the question moving forward, if you're doing kind of a balance of state actors, is do you care more about quality or quantity? That we clearly have a qualitative edge in this space, China, by comparison, has a quantitative edge. It has such a mass scale of people um, working in this realm. Uh, you know, it doesn't directly apply to cyber offense, but it more applies to cyber um, uh, to vetting and censorship. But basically, you have what they call, translates as the human flesh search engine, the massive number of people involved. That's on the cyber offense side. I believe uh, the US is ahead, but ultimately, we'll have to figure out what matters in terms of quantity or quality. Cyber defense? Well, the best at it is North Korea because they're not linked in. But who wants that set up? And that, again, goes back to that notion of accept and manage the risks rather than thinking that you know, the answer is to delink. So that seems to be our list of questions for this afternoon. I would ask Peter if he has any closing remarks or comments before we. So that we don't end on, on saying something good about North Korea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to uh, thank everyone, and again, to me, this space is so crucial because it true. I, I go back to that that point that I made um, that I'm deeply worried, not merely on us being taken advantage of, so to speak, again at the individual and the national political level, etc., but I'm more worried about the internet itself. It has been this incredible, awesome tool. And if we don't watch out, the combination of these things that I talked about are going to make it fundamentally different and I worry much, much worse for my kids. And so I hope we can all you know, take action collectively against that. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. Appreciate it.